Hello everyone, today is Tuesday, November 2nd, 2017. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate you being here, so thank you so much. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously current market conditions, your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, and this is for your benefit, for your benefit, wait until we get the actual charts before you ask about stocks. And then just ask about one at a time. And again, that's for your benefit to make sure we cover it. So what do we talk about? Well, the question is, is Bitcoin real? Should you invest in it? You know how I feel about investments, but what I'm going to say about it might surprise you. And... Should I trade it? Well, let's dive right in. I guess before we do that, we have to look at the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin. Is it real? How can a bunch of zeros and ones be real. I mean, I've got a bunch of zeros and ones on my computer. Is that worth anything? Well, I don't know. Before we get into its legitimacy, let's talk a little bit about money and what money is. I have billions actually trillions of dollars. And in addition to trillions of dollars, I also have millions of francs, liras, rupees, dongs, dinars, etc. And if you come to webinars where I actually am live, and eventually I might do this for the weekend charts. I used to do it years ago when I was doing the weekend charts through Telechart. I don't know if you guys remember that. That's where the show got started. But I'm just always scrambling to get ready. It's like by the time I get ready to do my show, there's not enough time to shave and and <laughs> and take a shower. But anyway, if you look behind me, I have these currencies displayed on my wall. I had a friend of mine come in from, from, Italy, uh, from um, Italy, Emilio Tomasini. He's like, these things are real? I'm like, yeah. He goes, I thought it was a backdrop. So he thought I had this backdrop behind me. But no, these are actual real currencies. Now, other than collective value and some, these notes are pretty much worthless. And some of them have some, I guess, aesthetic value. The money is what's known as a fiat currency. Now, if you look up the word fiat, just do a Google on that. It is a noun which says a formal authorization or proposition, a decree. And it comes from the Latin word, let it be done. So a government decrees its official currency. Fiat currencies have no intrinsic value. I have one or two silver certificates on the wall behind me, or those are no longer, uh, you can no longer turn those into silver. But years ago, I think it was pre-1964, before I was born, you could take a silver certificate and it was worth so much actual silver. And then I think 71, Nixus took us, took us off the gold standard. So our currency is only based on the trust in the government. It's backed by the government. It's the official currency. You can't take monopoly money down in the store and try to buy something because the government doesn't recognize that as official currency. Now, this is a $100 trillion note. This is actually real currency. And I used to keep one in my wallet and Supper time, not supper time, but like if I'm out to dinner with some friends and whoever, I'd throw one out on the table. Hey, I got, I got it. It's on me. 
Well, these bills are pretty much worthless. Now, as I said a minute ago, they do have some collective value. I bought, uh, I wish I'd have bought more. I bought, I think, 10 of them for about 10 bucks a few years back on eBay. And I just checked this morning right before I went live. And all I could find was uncirculated versions, which I think the ones I bought were. I'd have to go back and look. And they're selling for $53 a piece. Now, that's collective value. The notes are essentially worthless as far as a currency is concerned. Here's a gentleman with a bunch of Zim notes. This was actually taken in 2008. And this is what it takes to go buy, buy groceries. And maybe it's even worse since then. In fact, it likely is. Ian McCafferty, the late Ian McCafferty, used to do some very entertaining presentations. I remember at the first American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting, I sat down next to Greg Morris, who actually got me into the organization. He's like, you ever see this guy? I'm like, no. He's like, you're in for a real treat. <laughs> and it was. I mean, Ian could take the subject of world economics and gold and make it quite interesting. And this was one of his slides. And I poked around the Internet this morning to find it. This is a bathroom in South Africa and a public toilet, that is. And they don't want you throwing cloth diapers in there, a cardboard, a newspaper. And they also don't want you throwing Zimbabwe dollars in the toilet because they'll clog up the pipes. So this currency is so worthless, you can't even wipe your butt with it. All right, have a pop quiz for you. And the pop quiz is this. What is the average lifespan of a fiat currency? I did this research earlier this week. Don't don't Google it. Oh, just guess, please. What is the average lifespan of a fiat currency? I was pretty amazed at the answer that I got. And while we're waiting for you guys to come in, one year, five years, while we're waiting on you guys to answer, yeah, you're getting close, you're getting closer. Every fiat currency in the history of the world has failed. So that's pretty scary. Now, the answers were Donald says one year, Rick says five years, Alexandra says 25 years, John says 13 years, and Jill says 150 years. Well, when I did the research earlier this week, I thought it would be closer to what Jill says. I thought it would be 150 years because that seems about right. But Alexandra is actually the closest. The average lifespan of a fiat currency is 27 years. Now, that's pretty scary. So, so far in history, everyone has failed. doesn't mean that you might have an outlier. And I think our dollar, since we came off the gold standard, it's been more than 27 years. But that's the average. And that should scare you a little bit. So the question is, is Bitcoin real? Well, Bitcoin is just a bunch of zeros and ones, right? Again, it's just a bunch of zeros and ones. How could that be legitimate? Well, the real story is is in the blockchain. The blockchain is, is an even more potent technology. In essence, it is a shared, trusted public ledger that everyone can expect, but which no single user controls. The participants in the blockchain system collectively keep the ledger up to date. It can be amended only according to strict rules and by general agreement. Bitcoin's blockchain ledger prevents double spending and keeps track of the transactions continuously. It is what makes possible currency without a central bank, the economist. Okay. Well, that's, if you've never heard of a blockchain before, that doesn't make any sense or a lot of sense. But the real story is in the blockchain. So let's take a look at the blockchain with a massive oversimplification. Now, 
if you're a crypto cryptographer, easy for me to say, then go get a cup of coffee because I'm going to reduce this down to the most simplest terms. And there's a little bit more to it than what I'm saying. But for the layman, if you start getting into the nitty gritty of it, which I did a little bit because I do have a programming background just to kind of wrap my head around how it actually works. But quickly, I became pretty bored, too. So you don't have to worry about how it works. But if you understand the general concept of it, it'll make a lot of sense. Now, let's apply. Let's forget about the Bitcoin for a second. Let's apply blockchain to a car. And let's assume we're going to have a digital record of everything that happens in the history of that car. So the car is purchased at this point here, and that's the first link in the chain. Now, let's say you have some routine maintenance. Well, this routine maintenance is broadcast out to the network. And people get to see it. So it's a shared ledger. So you got a bunch of people. And we all take a look at this. And they look to see if the record references the prior record. And if the prior record references this record. So this is where their cryptography comes into play. And each one of these participants is looking at it and if they can figure out solve the mathematical equation that proves that this routine maintenance link is legitimate because it links back to the prior link then that link is verified now let's say the car you get a new alternator well then once again that gets broadcast out to the network and then people around the world take a look at that and see if it's legit. Now, why would these people want to take a look at these records? Well, there's money in it. The first person that can legitimize this record and is verified by other people on the node, they get a small amount of money, a little crumb. And then that record is verified. Now, let's say we have some routine maintenance, and it, of course, gets verified out through the nodes or whatever. And then now we have that link in the chain. And again, this is a massive oversimplification. Now, let's say the car gets flooded, and that record references the previous record, and then the previous record references that record, so it's legit. And then, of course, or assume I, should, uh, assume, I should say, that it gets repaired. And again, that record references the previous record, and this record references that one. So that gets added to the chain, so to speak. And then assume there's some routine maintenance afterwards, and that gets verified. Now, if somebody tried to come in with a brand new record, this record for this car already exists, so the network would toss it out. Instead of, let's say, Carfax, and I'm not picking on Carfax, but let's just say Carfax maintaining this, you have that one centralized database of Carfax, and you expect everybody there to be honest, which I'm sure they are. But maybe, let's say, some records get lost or messed up or whatever, then they're gone. But when you have this broadcast out to the world and verified, and that verification process, as you'll see in a second, is becoming very, very competitive. So it's, I would say, virtually impossible. I, I guess you should never say something impossible, but it's virtually impossible to duplicate this record because it already exists. It would get tossed out. There would it would be impossible for a collusion to happen because there's so many people would have to collude and then other people would keep them honest. And remember, they're all competing to make money off of this. So let's say 
someone who wants to be a little disingenuous decides to take out that flooding of the car and repairing of it, subsequent repairing, tries to break those chains, break that chain out, and then puts that back in. So it looks like, okay, we've got a new alternator here, routine maintenance, routine maintenance. Well, the problem is, and again, massive oversimplification, A, B, C, D, G. Okay, this should be E is what it should be because E comes after D. And then it will get tossed out because looking backwards, if it were a legitimate G record, then this should be F. So based on the network of this spread out truss, it would be impossible to change this record or duplicate this entire chain. So every transaction that happens gets chained in to the blockchain. Now, what's amazing is if you get a chance, go on YouTube and look at some of these mining, so-called mining forms. I did a Google image search and I typed in Bitcoin mining firm. They're mining these coins. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? How can you mine a coin? How can you mine something that's electronic? Well, what's happening is they are accountants. Each one of these little computers is a little accountant on a node, and there's thousands of them around the world, and they're all competing to legitimatize, 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 I think that's how you say it. If not, I just made up a new word, kind of like, a, was it a Jesse... What's his name? Makes up words. They're pretty good words, too, sometimes. Anyway, before I digress too far. So these Bitcoin miners are mining these coins. And this is just a bunch of little electronic accountants verifying these transactions that are happening. And it's, as you can see, it's a very extremely competitive business. And these computers generate a lot of heat. It's kind of fascinating. And the, the inner nerd to me is kind of coming out in all this. They figured out that a graphic card is actually better at figuring out these cryptography type of equations. And a lot of these computers are just a graphic card, and a power supply, very, very small, intense type of computer. And again, if you watch these YouTubes on them, you'll see like these places in China where the you can tell the noise of the fans is deafening. There's places in Iceland where they're using the geothermal to, to power the plants because the farms, I should say, because the, the electricity is just amazing in this and the heat generated and to cool it, you put it in a cool climate like Iceland makes it easier to cool it. So you can see that this industry is growing exponentially to keep up with this blockchain accounting. So blockchain is basically a circle of trust and it's going to revolutionize the way we do business. And like Greg, <laughs> if you try to do something disingenuous, there's so many people in the circle of trust, it's going to kick you out. Now, I found this quote right before I went with, uh, live with this. Every single type of business can be turned on its head with this technology. And it's going to re revolutionize the way we do business. So blockchain will revolutionize the way we do business. I would encourage you to learn about it. And more importantly, let's figure out what industries are going to capitalize on this, which industries aren't. And let's keep an eye on the charts as these things develop. And the blockchain is going to be much, much bigger than the Bitcoin itself. Case in point, goodbye IPOs, hello ICOs. Well, to do an initial public offering, let's say I want to take my company public. And I was involved with an Internet company that almost went public. <laughs> You probably wouldn't see my fat ass today if it did. 
and it would have had a valuation of a hundred million or I forget or a billion, I forget. I, yeah, it was just something ridiculous. One to billion, hundred million, man, eh, millionaire, millionaire. It begins to add up after a while. Anyway, long story, endless. In order to go public, as we were kind of beginning to look into, there was a lot of hoops and hurdles and things to jump through. Well, if you were to issue a coin offering based on your business, and a lot of these, it's my understanding that these initial coin offerings now are based on the Ethereum model, and many argue that Ethereum is actually a better cryptocurrency than Bitcoin itself. Bitcoin was the first and so forth, it's the biggest, obviously. But Ethereum has a, a better cryptography to it, a, a, according to some people's opinion. Now, I don't, I don't know enough about them just yet to make that opinion, but it's my understanding that a lot of these initial coin offerings are based on Ethereum. So let's say that I decide to take DaveLander.com public through an initial coin offering. You could buy actual shares and coins of my company. I could also do things like if you buy so much in product, then I can reward you so many coins. And if you, let's say you, you're loyal over uh, so many years or whatever, then you get rewarded a little piece of coin or something. So there's all kinds of things that can be done with these blockchain related type of events and any transaction regarding trust can be done much better now this is not just going to help the the people at, at that are highly intelligent and running businesses and taking businesses public something like cryptocurrencies and blockchains can let's say you have a maid in manhattan who's not making a lot of money but she Let's say she immigrated here and she's she's just scraping by, but she's able to get a little bit of money together to send her a mom. Well, if she wants to send her mom, let's say $35 and goes down to the bank to wire that, they're going to charge her probably $35 in fees. And it might take several days for her mom to get the money. But if she wanted to send her a cryptocurrency, that could be done instantly and she could do that herself. There's no central authority necessary to make that happen. Now let's get back to Bitcoin. I didn't realize this because I'm not a big fan of the news, but by accident I discovered that the CME, Chicago Merck, is going to launch Bitcoin futures. This happened Tuesday. I'm glad I found this out. So now I think this legitimizes Bitcoin, and now Bitcoin is trading over $7,000 right now. Now here's a couple of fun facts. There's 21 million Bitcoins in circulation. Now, it's often been said the difference between the United States and a third world country is the size of our printing presses. We just print some more money and everything's fine, whereas a third world country goes under. And that's kind of sad but true. Now, technically, Bitcoin can only have a maximum of 21 million. And all 21 million aren't in circulation. I think it's, it's they're going to be in circulation at the current rate by the year 2040. You'll have 21 million maximum. So technically, whether you believe in it or not, and, and I think you should be a little skeptical of all this, but let's just assume that this is true. Well, it is a devalued currency and not an inflated currency. I hope that I say that right. In other words, it can't be inflated through the printing of more. You can't have 40 million tomorrow and now it's only worth half of what it's worth today because there's only so many in existence. And little fun fact, $5 invested in Bitcoin seven years ago would be worth 14 million as of this morning. 
Now, the question is, is it a bubble? I did a little screen capture. This is a monthly chart, I think. This doesn't even go back to the inception. This is as far back as I can grab with this particular chart. Well, that looks like a bubble to me. But as a trader, who cares? Okay. We can ride a bubble as long as it goes higher and just have a chair ready for when the music stops. And then you could possibly short it on the way down. And it is actually shortable through certain brokerages, at least. Now, the question is, should I buy just one Bitcoin and forget about it? Well, my answer to that is yes, but with some caveats, okay? And I'm not going to, I know I just said the price is $7,000, but I don't want to base it on the on, on the on today's price. I just want to base it on the current price. So if you're watching this a year from now, two years from now, the price might be vastly different. And I want this content to be somewhat evergreen. So my answer is yes, I think everyone should buy one. With the caveat of if you would normally spend, insert the current price of Bitcoin, whatever that is, if you normally spend that much money a year on a hobby or golf or gas for your boat or some sort of thing that's frivolous and not going to have a material impact on your life. Well, when I started working on some of this material, <laughs> A month ago, whenever it was, Bitcoin was $4,000, and it's kind of like, eh, okay, well, $4,000, that's still a lot of money. But if you divide that over 12 months and you look at if you're spending a couple hundred dollars a weekend on golf or whatever, you know, it's a, it's, it's a lot less than, than you would spend on one Bitcoin. Well, now it's getting bigger and bigger, so now the Oregon's a little tougher to make. But the point is, if, you, if it's not going to have a material impact on your life, then by all means, buy one. But Dave, I thought you said there are no good investments. Well, I still believe that. And I firmly believe that there really aren't any, any actual good investments, at least not longer term. And I did a whole column just on that. But my point is, if you're not going to trade them, which we'll get into in just one minute, then I think there's no harm and buying one, and again, I'm not allowed to give direct investment advice, but my point is that if that one coin wouldn't have a material impact on your life. Now, I think it's kind of hard to buy into this bubble at this point, but I think that it's okay to own one if you wanted to be an investor. I think they're much better traded, which we'll get into in one second. They're not without their problems, and I can go on and on on this. The bottom line is the one thing that makes them great is also a potential problem. For instance, there was a crash in Ethereum, which is supposed to be a superior coin. Well, when I heard about this crash back in June, I said, aha, those cryptos are BS, just like I thought. Well, it wasn't the actual, nothing really was wrong with the coin or nothing got hacked. It was a brokerage who had a stop order in their system or was gave you the ability to do stop orders. And a million contract came through and they just spit them out into the market and everybody got filled. Everybody stopped out. 800 and something stop orders got triggered. And the cryptocurrency literally went down to 10 cents. And the exchange said, sorry. And basically said that you, you read how a stop works. You put in a stop order. That means you take whatever price you get. You take what you get. You don't throw a fit. Well, it seems that in recent weeks, they have begun to recant a little bit. And they may actually be reimbursing some people who got screwed in a deal. Now, keep in mind, they're not unwinding trades. So an exchange could actually unwind trades. And they could they could go back and say, okay, you made this trade. It was just on a blit, a glitch, a glitch or whatever. You're you're we're taking this trade away from you. 
no, you can't have that Ethereum at 10 cents. We're going to take it away from you because that's BS. What they're going to have to do is they're going to have to take that money out of their pocket to make that good. These exchanges are not regulated exchanges. Now, the CME, CME is a regulated exchange, but it looks like you're going to be buying a derivative or selling a derivative of Bitcoin there and not the actual Bitcoin itself. I had recently set up two accounts with these exchanges and the one of the ones who got in trouble or whatever you want to, how you look at it with the stops. And then another one, and I tried, it said, the other one said, okay, well, you have to set up an account with, with this company we're affiliated with so you can get your money here quickly via Bitcoin. Well, two weeks later, my money's still missing. And I'm like, well, did I just piss away that money? Did it go into an ether? And then I wanted to see how long it wasn't a lot for purposes of this presentation. I was willing to forego that to see what would happen. And, you know, I sent him a, of course, I sent him a WTF. And then I got a notice on my cell phone that I need to uh, generate a new address. That's how you trade these coins. You generate an address if you well to, to buy them. And I did that, and then it became an instant transaction. So the transaction should always be an instant transaction, but I found it very interesting that something that should have been an, uh, an immediate transaction as per this, this exchange, after two weeks, the money still wasn't there. And I wasn't too worried about it because when I go to the, the person they told me to open the account with, the money was in there, and it just said internal transfer. It just didn't go to the brokerage. So... And, they, and I got charged a, a node fee for that, which is kind of interesting. So it is kind of the wild, wild west with, with all of this right now. Here's a scary thing. When your asset, when your Bitcoins are in an account with one of these brokerages right now, that asset is no longer in your control, technically. It's not like, and there's no, there's no government backing or anything in this. So if, let's say you open up a brokerage account, and I forget what SIPC is right now. It used to be 500K. I don't pay attention to all that stuff. But let's assume it's still 500K. F, uh, SIPC is like FDIC, which is 100K per account for your banking. So if your bank goes under, like say, let's Bob's bank. Bob decides to take all the money and run, well, the government's going to pay you back at least 100K on every account or 100K per account. If some brokerage, some major stock brokerage, some regulated major stock brokerage does something disingenuous, then you have a case with the SEC and the government and you're backed by the government insurance up to 500K per account. I think that's what it is. So, there is no central authority, you, and it's my understanding that you cannot unwind trade. So it really is the wild, wild west. Now, should you trade it? My answer is yes. Again, with caveats. You need to treat it like any other efficient market. In other words, you want to pick your spots carefully. Now, because you have a representative sample, technical analysis will work. If, you, if you've come to these presentations before, you've seen me talk about the fact that you need a representative sample for technical analysis to work. Technical analysis is basically reading the psychology of the market and the emotions of the market while at the same time embracing your own. Not controlling your own, just embracing and accepting your own. And that's, a, that's probably going to be 15-hour course by the time I get done with all the material I want to cover just on that. But if you boil it all down, that's what technical analysis is, is reading the psychology of the market while at the same time embracing your own psychology. Now, in order for it to work, you have to have a representative sample. If you have a market where you have very few players – then one or two players can make a big trade or do whatever they want to do and either intentionally or not manipulate that market or create possibly a false market. 
But if you have a lot of traders in there, then that becomes a, then that becomes a psychology of the market. Yogi Berra once said, if the world were perfect, it wouldn't be. And that's why markets actually work. If markets were perfect, they wouldn't be. If everybody agreed on price, then there would be no market. And that disagreement between the people, the, diff the psychology that changes between the people is what makes a market. But again, you need a representative sample for that to work. So Bitcoin, which is trading billions of dollars a day, has a representative sample. And I just put up a weekly chart. I thought that'd be interesting to show. And there's a few things that just kind of jump out at you. There's been some pullbacks along the way. There's been a TKO not that long ago. And then, of course, there's a big blue arrow. So, yes, it is a bubble. But if you think about it, it's our job to seek out bubbles and get on. Ideally, we want to get in the bubble relatively early. But as a trend follower, you will be a little late to the game. And I would encourage you, of course, as a trader, to exercise proper money management. I, someone, kind of man on the street type of thing, but a, a friend of my wife's or a business associate of my wife was asking me about Litecoin, which is another cryptocurrency. And she was talking about some guy made all this money in it. But he sold out and he would have made 10 times that amount or whatever it was. Well, what people fail to realize is you can apply money management. You don't, you, you won't, you don't and you won't. <laughs> you don't have to get out of all at once. And then you won't be 100% correct. Everybody thinks they have to be correct and time the sale perfectly. You could scale out of a little bit and... If it truly is a bubble that keeps on going, you could still make money on the rest. Trail stop, so to speak. So a couple of little take out, takeaways really quick. Oh, a TKO, a trend knockout. Okay. A trend knockout is uh, where you have a market that has a sharp sell-off over one bar, makes a wide range down. It knocks out people. And when the market trades back above that point and this is kind of a tko here too it's not quite as obvious as this one but when the market trades back above that point anybody who got out has to decide whether or not they want to get back in and anyone who shorted it because they believed it was a bubble has to put up a shut up and eventually what's happening is maybe some of this that you're seeing up here in this bubble is from way back here if you go to my website after the presentation, davelander.com slash videos, I did a video on TKOs and I talk about, I think it'd be a good introduction to technical analysis as far as how it works with the psychology of the market, because there's a lot of psychology behind a TKO pattern. And it amazes me, something so simple. I came up with that in the 90s and it still works today. In fact, if that's the only pattern you traded, I think you do okay especially if you combine it with persistency and acceleration and trend. Okay, as I was going live with this, there was just a couple of random thoughts I wanted to get out on all this. Blockchain is bigger than Bitcoin. And I would encourage you to, if you get bored, start watching YouTubes on blockchain. Maybe start with like the TED Talks because they're pretty fascinating and I think you would trade it just like anything else. I had a friend that once said many, many years ago, probably in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, he said, uh, if they found out that – this is how I really talk. I'm not making make it fun. This is how I really talk. He's like, if they found out that hyper – that, let me start over. If they found out that, that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he would buy hypodermic needles. Well, not that bad. And – it isn't on the rise, is it? But I would, I will buy things that go up. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of, of, of when I first met Greg Morris on a bus. We were in a bus in Italy going to a disco. And I'm pretty gregarious, outgoing kind of guy, as you can tell. But I do get a little shy around 
people like Greg Morris who have achieved a lot in their lives. And at the time he's running between five and $8 billion. So I just got to sit there quietly. And my wife sometimes tags along on these things and she's, she's pretty good at breaking the ice. So she's asked Greg what he does and Greg explained everything he does and talked about some of the technical analysis and everything that he looks into. And then Marcy turns to me and says, well, Dave, isn't that, you do, isn't that what you do? And I said, no, I just, I just buy things that go up and sell things that go down. And I'll never forget it. Greg turned around and pointed a finger at me. He goes, he's got the right idea. So that was very, I was very excited to, to, to hear that, that I had the right idea. And when you boil it all down, things are either going up, down or sideways. So treat it like any other market but just know that it's an efficient market or will become more and more efficient now there's not enough time to get into it today but if you go to my website under the store davelandry.com store and i make you walk through the gift shop scroll down to the bottom there's a list of free reports and there's one on efficiency the importance of market efficiency i did a whole article on that i think it was originally published in traders magazine many years ago but read that article and you'll know as much as i do about market efficiency when i discuss stock selection which i did a little bit of last week i talk a lot about efficiency and as a general statement you want to be trading inefficient stocks and as a general statement you want to be shorting efficient stocks on the flip side, because everything is sort of priced in to an efficient stock. And when that stock begins to roll over, it creates a disequilibrium. And the other thing I would encourage you to read in those free reports is one that I did called Go Go No Mo. And that explains the shorting of efficient stocks. So treat them like efficient markets. Pick your spots carefully. One thing that I might do. With Bitcoin that I'm right now I'm just holding on but one thing that I might do with Bitcoin is the reason I'm holding on is I don't want to get too cute with it. I just want to have it play a little game it's like, okay well how long can I ride this bubble but in the currencies what I like to do is I like to look for a multi-year high ideally and then look for some sort of hourly chart to turn because these markets are very efficient, I think, by drilling down to the hourly chart, if that major turn occurs, you're able to catch it on the hourly. And if you don't catch it on the hourly, let's say you get stopped out, your losses are somewhat minimal. And I've been doing that for quite a while, and that seems to be working okay. And I like doing something like a bow tie or something like that on an hourly basis. But for the most part, I do focus on stocks and ideally these inefficient stocks and try to capture that inefficient type of move so again use technical analysis uptrend downtrend sideways tkos bow ties those type of things and remember that it's probably going to become more and more efficient market because now now that cme is jumping in there's going to be hedgers and speculators and all kinds of people trading those cryptocurrencies specifically the bitcoin so it will become more of a choppy market at some point in time. Okay, uh, blockchain is a general ledger technology. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like it's a shared ledger. So if you were trying to make a transaction between, let's say I want to send you some money, well, I would have to go to a bank and pay a lot of money and we wait a few days and wonder where that money went to and then eventually like you you'll call me up did you send it did you send it did you send it sometimes when i do some transactions with people overseas they'll call me a couple times they'll email me to skype me where's the money where's the money where's the money i sent it you know it kind of goes to this black hole whereas where it's a, a a publicized a public ledger then all these people confirm the transaction and bam the transaction goes through within seconds because as you saw from that image search I did earlier, there's a lot of people competing for that transaction. 
All F all FLs are using it. All FIs. What's an FI, Alexandra? All FIs are using it. Blockchain is a technology. When you say trade blockchain, do you mean Ethereum as it uses blockchain? Uh, no. No, what I'm saying is blockchain is going to be much bigger. And a lot of people are saying it's the it's the dot com, it's the internet of the 2000s. And some people are poo-pooing that, but I think it's going to be huge. So what I would encourage you to do is to recognize the how it's going to revolutionize industry and i'm not even sure how i'm going to stay ahead of the curve with this so you know if you guys want to email me some blockchain applications or some stocks that that are using blockchain or something that i should start watching i'm basically watching all stocks there anyway all stocks that are tradable so i'm thinking i'll be able to pick it up by doing that by remaining that pure technician but let's get outside of trading for a while. This blockchain could be huge in, into all the things that it can do. And it's already being, I think, as Alexandra's pointed out, financial trust, financial institutions. Yes, it's already being accepted and incorporated into big, major financial institutions. Absolutely. Yeah, the Bitcoin now, the bit, there is a symbol called GBTC, which is a... It's, it's considered like a penny stock now or uh, what do you call a stock that's off the exchange? GBTC is a is a way to invest in a stock that invests. If it's not recognized, I don't think any stocks have been recognized just yet. And there's not an ETF just yet, but there will be. The fact that the Merck is involved, there's going to be an ETF on this. I'm not sure how it's going to work, but I think we need to pay attention. Do you need to pay tax in trading Bitcoin? That's a good question that I don't have the answer to. The, the, the quick answer I would say is yes, you have to because you have to pay your taxes. But I don't know, I, I don't know how I, I guess I would show I would show what I did this year and I would pay taxes on that amount. But that's sort of the that's sort of the as I said earlier, it's the wild, wild west. So that's one of the things that people are pointing out. Well, it's the currency of the drug dealers. Okay. Well, you used to you used to carry a big briefcase full of money. And it was easier to do in Europe because you could get a 500 euro note. Okay. And they, I don't know if they're completely phased them out or what, or what's going to happen, but the euro, 500 euro note, made it too easy for the drug dealers because you could put a lot of 500 euros in a briefcase. In fact, a million $100 bills, believe it or not, will fit into a knapsack. Believe it or not, a book bag. You can put a million dollars in a book bag. So you could probably put, I guess you could put $5 million of, uh, or 5 million euros into a book bag. So it makes it a lot easier for them. But if all you had to do was like click a little mouse What's that, uh, what's that movie, uh, Ozark or whatever, the series, where he was justified to, he, in the series Ozark. He justified, uh, what's his name, Jason Bateman? He justified to his wife laundering money for the drug deal. It is a little bit more to it than that, but he justified to his wife, oh, I'm just going to be pushing a mouse around. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a bit of an oversimplification. But, yes, the drug dealers, it's the currency of drug dealers. So this is not without its problems, but I think that we need to get ahead of the curve on this. And this is why this presentation, my apologies, it might seem a little rough because a lot of it just came in this morning. I've been working on it for weeks, but it's like, you know, it's time to get ahead of the curve on this thing before it's too late. Wow, well, Bitcoin $7,000, Dave, is it too late? I don't know. But I think we need to, we need to pay attention. Outside of Coinbase, would you trade a derivative? GBTC is an OTC exchange. Um, so far, I haven't done any derivatives. I have accounts with a couple of uh, online. You have people where you could, uh, like Coinbase, where you could you could uh, actually purchase the Bitcoin, and they actually hold them for you in your account. But obviously, 
that asset of yours is in someone else's hands and there's a bit of a scariness to that so that's that's where the, the there's no trust in that you have to trust that one institution now you can keep your own coins on your own so-called bit wallet and you know that's one of the one of the things that that was is pointed out that there will be fewer of these bitcoins because people will lose them through a hard drive crash or whatever. But yeah, to physically actually have one sort of quote, I'm making air quotes, you would actually have to download it to a bit wallet. But as soon as you begin to trade that Bitcoin and it's, it's actually on an exchange, that asset is out of your control. So that's that, you know, I'm just scratching the surface here. That's another problem. So that's, that's pretty scary. Okay, regarding tax, from what I know, it's tax lighter collectible, and you pay tax even on unrealized. Well, that's interesting. Well, how is a how is a collectible tax? Because my if my Zimbabwe note went up fifty three dollars fifty three times, do I have to pay a tax on that? Sam says absolutely, you have to pay taxes on the Bitcoin trade just like any other investment. Yeah, that's what I would say. Okay, that's what the IRS says now, tax like uh, collectible. I'm a recovering CPA as Sam. Yeah, I agree. You know, let's let's not try to let's not try to evade taxes with this thing. I'm gonna report it to my CPA and let him figure it out, you know? That's why I pay him a lot of money. Yeah, uh Haha, <laughs> I don't know, but GLD is taxed like that. Look it up. Yeah, GLD is a is a um, an ETF, and don't you get like a K99 or a K? I don't forget what it is. It's some sort of weird thing you get on that. The agreed upon price is the last price. Yes. Yeah, it is the Wild Wild West. Agreed. Can you direct an order to Mount Gox? I don't know what that is. See, I'm showing my my ignorance. I have two uh, a, a two count two accounts two exchanges. It's kind of interesting. After the debacle that happened at uh, I guess I could say the I guess I could say the name. It's public record at GDAX. After the debacle at GDAX, another exchange immediately remove stops from their system so you can't put in a stop on their system take a riot riot blockchain okay we'll take a look at that one good idea transparency for bitcoin yeah any of these transactions are seen by the network now a couple of random thoughts i left this slide in from a couple of weeks ago and over the summer i did a little a few presentations where i talked about winter is coming and make it a little fun of Mr. John Snow there, who knows nothing. What's interesting is there's a lot of imminent top fear mongering. And I just want to point this out. And if you watch these presentations, you'll see that I've been saying this week after week after week. And what has the market done? It's gone higher so far. And we're going to take a look at that in just one second. So what I would encourage you to do is yes winter is coming eventually it's going to end badly and it kind of scares me but not just yet in the meantime we just need to be a moron are we in a stock market bubble probably do bubbles in badly yes am i interviewing myself yes <laughs> like john mccain he used to interview himself it's kind of funny but for now, let's just follow along. Let's wait for signs. And you're probably thinking, okay, well, give me a sign. Well, let's say we get a weekly bow tie sell signal. I would pay careful attention to that. But we haven't had one of those on the downside since 2007. So I think we're okay for now. All right, let me pop into the charts. And if you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, Feel free to do so now. Let's take a look at the overall market and let's drill down to some sector action. And then 
go from there. Okay, S&P 500, a little bit of sell-off today. I wouldn't get too excited just yet. I would encourage you to err on the side of the longer-term trend. And as a trend follower, as long as the market is at or near all-time highs, then stay long and don't fight it. And you can see this market has been at or near all-time highs for a long, long time. Be careful not to get caught up in some of the shakeouts along the way. Do pay attention. I was a little bearish back here, okay? And I think we had a daily bow tie down off of all-time highs, if memory serves. Yeah, we had a daily bow tie down, but you can see it really didn't materialize, okay? The bow tie set up right in here somewhere. And then we had this little opening gap reversal, and then the market went right back up. Well, even if you did get bearish and shorted it, then guess what? And this is kind of what I'm doing on a microcosm level in the currencies. My stop's up here. If it goes on to make new highs, I'm wrong. Get out, okay? Get, the, get out of the way. That's what a trend follower does. But so far, longer-term uptrend still intact in the S&P 500, looking pretty darn good. Let's take a look at NASDAQ. You can see NASDAQ. Oh, let me show you a weekly signal real quick. I don't know. I used to show them every uh, presentation. And somebody asked me to please stop. But you had a weekly signal here. You had a weekly signal here. Those were sales. Weekly bow tie up. And then a weekly bow tie up here in a weekly. This was a little late to the game. But still, I mean, if you could, if you would sell me S&Ps at 900 today, I, I would take them. You know? <laughs> Especially with the market at 2,600 up here, round numbers. So when we do get that weekly bow tie down, I think it's going to pay to pay attention. And that would that would have me a little nervous about the markets. Certainly want to honor your stops when that occurs. And you can get bow ties off my website, too, uh, under free reports. Let's take a look at the Russell. Let's take a look at NASDAQ first. NASDAQ pulling back a little bit, but nice uptrend so far remains intact. So let's not fight it for now. Let's take a look at the Russell 2000. We had that opening gap reversal yesterday, outside day down, but it's not the end of the world, nor can you see it from here. I think it's just consolidating. We broke out of this ridiculously long base. In fact, I'm actually glad to see it consolidate so it doesn't just blow off and then implode. This is a nice little consolidation. It looks a little bit better when you look at like a, a weekly chart. Let's zoom in a little bit. When you look at a weekly chart, it just kind of looks like a so-called flag pattern, which is actually bullish. So, so far, so good on that. Now, what's kind of interesting is some of these areas that lost a little steam in here, like the energies, but look pretty good, came back nicely, as you can see. And they're recently banging out multi-year highs. Some areas that looked even worse, like health services not that long ago, looked like they were rolling over a couple of times. But they're now back up here banging out new highs. Now, all in great in the world, some areas like biotechnology and drugs are looking a little bit dubious in here. In fact, let me just see if we got a daily bow tie. Yep, that's a beautiful daily bow tie down. All the moving averages come together, spread out, higher high. So that's actually triggering today. Let's take a look at biotechnology. A similar sort of pattern. But you can see it certainly has lost some steam as of late. So you want to pick your spots very carefully. I wouldn't rush out and short these areas just yet, but you do want to pick your spots carefully because all in great in the world. But the good news is, and I think foods come to mind, it seems like any time an area begins to implode, it comes right back. Now, obviously, that will work until it don't. I'm not saying trade this in and of itself, but I'm just saying that overall – most areas, you can almost throw a dart. I'm just kind of flipping through a few random ones in here. Look pretty darn good longer term. And especially anything technology related, or most anything technology related. I mean, telecom's kind of uh, dubious at best, as you can see here. But most everything technology related, hardware, software, got to have software for your hardware, right? Looking pretty good in here so far. Okay, yeah, let's, lo let's open it up for individual stocks, unless you guys have any questions on sectors or anything. All right, 
Sushi Sushi says, I hope I get your name right again. My tongue sticks to the top of my mouth in these presentations. Oh, drink some water. Well, I'm 50 something years old. Then I don't have to go pee. <laughs> A little bit too much information? I'm sorry. Yeah, good eye on that. Now, we were talking about efficiency earlier. The ETF for the XHB is only uh, has an efficiency of 10. If you look at some of the stocks we trade, we'll trade 40, 50, 60, maybe as high as 80, 90 in the, in the historical volatility readings. Okay. So I wouldn't rush out and trade the XHB, but absolutely, it certainly looks okay. You've got a nice little run in here, nice little TKO move. Okay. So if it trades back above today's high it would be a buy in fact it's almost textbook in nature it's what I call a double top knockout but by all means you could buy it above today's high if it gets there and only if it gets there and put a stop below the low if it doesn't trigger if it doesn't come up here and trigger then no capital is put in harm's way my only problem is it's an efficient market and and so you would have to trade a lot of shares to make it worth your while because it took it, what, uh, weeks and months just to go up a couple of points. So it's not going to make a big move percentage-wise. And something bad could still happen, okay? There's still a black swan sort of outlier event that could happen. Now, you might be thinking like something like the outlier today in Kim. Well, but yeah, that's okay because you make enough money along the way. And then, yeah, it sucks in the end, but that's why we scale out, and that's why that's a quote-unquote free position. Yeah, it still sucks. I'm still dropping F-bombs, you know. <laughs> okay, KL, this actually looks a little bit more like a short than a long. I wouldn't short it. One, we're in a bull market, and I just wouldn't rush out and short a stock like this. But you can see that it's pushing back into this overhead supply so far. I would wait for it to get new highs and then look to play uh, pullbacks along the way. DRNA, smoke if you got them. There it goes, yeah. Yeah, this is one on the, uh, on the service. I don't want to brag too much because we got we got spanked today. And we had a few, today's presentation was actually going to be on discretion but i wanted to get especially with the cme coming in with the bitcoin i actually want to come in and talk about bitcoin first yeah they give it and they take it away yeah that's and that's the hard part about trading is that and, and i'm working to and trust me it's like i mean right now we're on six acres i've got this huge office that i'm only using half of if that much and we're thinking about downsizing. It's like, well, if we downsize, <laughs> my wife's going to think I'm crazy. She can't hear me in here screaming and hollering. I dropped some, I've dropped, you know, I, I admit it. I'm still human. I dropped serious F-bombs this morning. The problem is if you let that break you mentally, then you're going to miss the next opportunity. And it makes it tough. Okay. Mt. Gox Bitcoin exchange based on Sh uh, Shabu, Japan, handling 70% of all Bitcoin. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's it's wild, wild west. I've never heard of Mt. Gox. Um, I've heard bad things about one exchange that I'm with. And then the other exchange had that Ethereum debacle. So be darn careful. That's all I have to say, especially if you're going to invest. Only put up money that you could you, you're willing to lose. I think would be my CMA on that for now. Okay. Okay. Howard says is SIFS a TKO? Yes. This was on my Landry list for today, but it's actually too volatile for me. Believe it or not, it's just a little too crazy. The HV, as you can see, is a little bit over 100, 100 and change. But this is what I would call a textbook TKO. You've got a nice, accelerating, persistent trend. You've got this big knockout move. 
So your entry would be above this high and your stop would be below the low. It's a textbook TKO. Do a search on my website for textbook TKO and you should uh, you should get a lot of uh, hits on that or a few hits. Let's see if we, we can try it. Okay, while well, we're waiting on that, A, B, B, V. Just in case, this is just a little search right here. Do a search on textbook, TKO. And you should get quite a few hits. And there's some videos. And if you scroll down, you got a lot of hits down here on that. So if you're interested in that pattern, check it out. Ticker Riot, Riot Blockchain. Okay. They have it as diagnostic substances. That's a that's a um, a blockchain. Well, this stock's kind of all over the place, but it's got enough volume to where it'll come up in my scans. I mean, that's the other thing too. I mean, anything. I, I think the uh, gentleman Alex, I forget his last name already, but whatever he said, it's going to revolutionize every business. It, it will. I mean, your your health records could be a blockchain. There's anything that can be, I guess, a record can be kept of, can change, can be part of a blockchain. CCS for Jerry. CCS, CCS. Um, this is a big, thick, efficient stock, okay? A lot of volume in this stock. What's that? One, two, three, two hundred. Is it, I always forget how TC does this. It's two zeros. So that would be it's 28 million shares. Let's just say 29 million shares that on average are traded. OK. And you could see that if we you could see that over the period of months and months and months, it really hasn't gone anywhere. done a whole lot. You know, 11% move over that period of time, and that's if you got in at the low. You know, you could you could go back, let's say, all the way to last December, and it's only up 2%. Well, you know, you take a look at one of the crazy stocks that we trade at 11%. 11% is one afternoon. That's 30% in one day. Now, I'd be okay with a gradual 11% after recently. <laughs> Dave, that's CCS. Please look at CCS. Did I look at CCS? CCS. Oh, well, this is a REIT. Um, the problem I have with it, one, the HV is a little bit on the low side. Volume slightly low, but it's okay. And it's just getting barely past this prior peak in here. I like to see a stock clear the prior peak, he tried to say, decisively before pulling back. Okay, dollar car. What is that? Is it car or is that something else? Scar? Dollar car. Bob, what, are you, uh, what symbol are you asking for? Sorry, it's taking me a while to get to you. Dollar car. Car? Maybe car? Well, for me to get excited about this one, it's no longer set up, so it would have to make new highs and stay there. It's also fairly efficient. You see the HV is uh, pretty low on this one. So it would have to break out and keep going. If that's the one you're asking about. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, put her on your watch list by all means. All right, Jim. You're waiting patiently. Let's take a look at Zag. This one looks okay. This was a TKO a few days ago since we seem to be focusing on those TKOs. And the textbook entry would have been above the high, and then the textbook stop would be below the lows. Okay. Uh, but now it would wait for it to make or continue to make new highs and then look to play pullbacks along the way. Steven waiting patiently for TSN. Good good uh, questions today, good comments, and a couple of good stock picks coming in. 
Uh, this is a food. I'm not that excited as a general statement about foods. I mean, other than eating them. I've been on a diet for months. But uh, you can see it's kind of all over the place. HV relatively low at 20. Um, you know, maybe if it made new highs and pulled back, but I think you could probably find something better uh, given today's markets. Rick's been waiting patiently for IEMG, easy for me to say. Yeah, this is emerging markets. Again, it's going to be an ETF, so it's going to be a little bit more efficient. So it should be traded. Pick your spots carefully, but you can see it's been in a nice trend. So as a trend guy, I can't argue with that. It's at, is it all-time highs? Let's take a look at that. Yeah, it's at all-time highs. That's a monthly chart. So on pullbacks along the way, if you look in the game, some foreign exposure. What's interesting about IEMG? There's a couple other ones too. There's a couple other, these emerging markets. Isn't there like EMG or something else? What's the difference between those two? Glue, G-L-U-U. Um, the only thing I don't like about this one is that it pulled back all the way to its prior base. This is one I've been watching, but it pulled back all the way to its prior base. It looks okay, but based on the fact that it came all the way back to here, I would pass. I mean, you, you could certainly do much worse because you could argue that, well, the run from here to here was pretty big. And then it really needed a deep pullback. So it looks okay. But I think in, if you had to go after it, maybe above this high and then stop down here below the base. But again, on a micro level, I don't like the way it came all the way back into its prior base. That's what, if I had to pick it apart. All right, Jerry, we got you. LPTH, light path, I think. Well, this was kind of interesting because it did take out its prior peak in here. And it did sort of take off higher. I'd like to see a little bit more pullback with the caveat that if it pulls all the way back to the base, then ignore it. So yeah, put that on your watch list. I think it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. NUA, NEWA. Uh, this one's worth watching. Relatively new issue. My, if you had to boil down my beliefs and new issues, is buy them when they go up, okay? They don't go up, don't buy them. And you can see it's up here making new highs. So, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely, I think it might be worth a shot. Put it on your watch list. Andre, let's talk about EC. All right, let's take a look at this. Well, it's uh, breaking out. So, yeah, on a pullback, look for a pullback TKO. I think that's plausible. Um, I do like the fact that it made this big, long, ridiculously long base down here. It has a bit of that Phoenix characteristic. To, ideally, though, I'd like to see if this base would have. I dated a country girl once. If I had my rathers. If I had my rathers. That's about it. She talked like a, like a female Ross Perot. If I had my rathers. <laughs> I guess she had her rathers because she'd rather be with somebody else. Where was I going with that? All right. Uh, anyway. I'd rather it have based way down here, but it's a pretty impressive base. And as I often preach, the bigger the base, the bigger the launch in the space. So, yeah, on a pullback, it could uh, certainly take off. Good eye on that one. You're welcome, Bob. John wants to talk about GDS, GDS. Um. If you're long, stay long. I wouldn't rush out and buy it at this juncture. It is still a relatively new issue, so it still has some promise to it. Uh, maybe on a TKO type of move, you could end up with like a double top knockout. That's where you have a little peak and another little peak not too far away, about four days or more, but not a whole bunch away to where it loses steam. But if it sold off fairly hard, let's say down to about 13 and a half, then, yeah, it could be a possible double top knockout. But definitely put that one on your watch list for sure. Good eye on that, John. You know, here's the deal. Um, you know, sound like, I'm going to sound like I'm sucking up, but um, you people have gotten much better over the years. And so I'm, I'm definitely humbled by you guys asking me about trends that are stocks that are nicely trending and This one looks okay longer term. If I if I zoom in a little bit, I can kind of pick it apart. 
because you could see one thing I always talk about, and if you go in and watch, I think it was last week's presentation, which is a redo of the one before because I forgot to record. I talked about the importance of proper stock selection. And if you don't know anything about stock selection, then just know that you want to look at the net net price move. So where's the price now? Round number is about 90 bucks a share. Where was the price way back in September? Round number is about 90 bucks a share. Yes, it's had a pretty darn good run, okay? And the point I was trying to make last week is that this is pretty impressive, but you also have to pay attention to this, okay? This good, this bad, okay? So that's the only problem. So what I would do is I would let the stock make new highs and then look to trade pullbacks along the way. NVMI. Okay, that's a little bit too extreme of a knockout, okay? So, and it didn't really break out that much. So it broke out a little bit and then came back in. If, uh, if it'll let me do it, if it would have broken out like this, and then your knockout bar looks like, like that, yes. But what happened here was it pulled all the way back into the prior range. W day, W D A Y. Um, well, the first thing jumps out at me is the net net price change, and then if you back it up a couple days, it really hasn't gone anywhere in a long while. So for a case in a case like this, I would have to break out to new highs decisively, and then I would look to play pullbacks along the way. A, B, B, V. We cover that one? Sounds familiar. Yeah, we covered that one. Okay. M, F, G, P. M, F, G, P. Okay. Um, it's kind of an interesting stock. Trades in a narrow range. It's a little bit on the thin side. Relatively new issue, 29 to 35. It's not a huge range for uh, an IPO. Uh, maybe on a pullback. It also looks like it could be foreign, so it looks like these gaps in here are somewhat artificial. It doesn't mean that it's it's not an interesting uh, stock to trade. Look at it. Let's take a look at a weekly. Yeah, uh, maybe on a pullback. Now uh, it can't pull if it doesn't. It can't pull back below 33 though. And the HV is fairly low for, for an IPO. I prefer a little bit more excitement in an IPO. But it's not bad, Howard. I can't beat you up too bad on that one. Andre wants to talk about IO. Um, it's a little wide and loose. It took it just pulled back forever here, so I would probably toss it out. I know we watched that DR, DRNA forever. But... Now what I would do with this one is I do like the fairly low level characteristic of it. So what I would do now is I would wait to see if it could bust out to new highs and then trade pullbacks along the way. I know you're already long. I know how you work, Andre. But uh, yeah, sit tight if you're long. Jay wants to talk about UK. 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 Never heard of it. Oh, I don't have that symbol. UK. That's why I never heard of it. It's not in my database, Jay. Russia, R U S A, R U S H A. Okay. Um, a little bit on the thin side. So obviously you can get in trouble trading these thin stocks. My big problem is the latest breakout is just one bar up. Okay. Plus it's thin, so. I think I would pass on that. I can't fault you because you certainly could draw a big blue arrow on the chart, but I think I would pass and see see what else is out there. Okay. John was talking about Nexa, N E X A, N E X A. Uh, yeah, this could be a buy at B. My only caveat here is that notice that it came public at 16 and it only made it up to 18. So you want to see a little bit more excitement in an IPO than just a couple of points of trade, okay? So let's see, one, two, three, four, 
I mean, technically, you could get a buy at B by the end of today. If you're willing to risk, if you could stomach a risk back to the open and put your stop there and forget about it, like that one Bitcoin, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, then it's, but then yes. But my only problem is, again, it's a little bit on the uh, narrow range. Now, with IPOs, as I often say, there's two types of setups. The Often the, the greatest opportunity is in what I call the pioneer setups. They come public and then we have like a little breakout pattern or something. Now, in general, I don't trade breakouts with the exception of IPOs. Now, if you miss the first breakout tra pattern or you decide for reasons that I just give, gave that you might not trade it, then the good news is if it truly is a real deal, you'll usually get a second chance some sort of pullback or TKO or something along the way. And there's a few other patterns we're watching for that are more specific to the IPOs. If only was if only there was a course on trading IPOs. Oh, I wish there was. I've been a victim of my own success here. People have done so well trading the IPOs that uh, they're not interested in anything else. <laughs> Which I say, that's great, but we won't always have an IPO bull market. One of the few things I can guarantee. J-A-S-N for Andre. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, it jumps out. At, what jumps out is you have a lot of overhead supply to deal with. I guess it'd be a good problem. But I'd probably toss it out based on that. Also, super duper thin given the price. It's a $2 stock. And you only have, what, uh, 130000 140000 on average volume. So it's pretty thin. So overhead supply, kind of thin. I think I'd probably toss it out based on that. Yeah, it's got Andre written all over it. I, I begin to learn you guys style. I know Phil's trading that 50-day moving average. Andre's trading these little crazy stocks. Dan on a pullback. Sure. Or as Ray Donovan would say, sure. <laughs> yeah, nice little uptrend here. Uh, hitting all-time highs. Absolutely. You answered your own question. Good job, Jerry. High five. ENTG for Carlson. Carlson, where are you located? You in Germany? Sounds like a German name. Um, yeah, put this on your watch list. Maybe on a uh, pullback. I can't argue with it. Certainly a nice little um, persistent uptrend. Yeah, Germany. Cool. I have to come visit again. Uh, you want to short this? Too crazy. Once you have these big, huge gaps down, you just want to get out of the way. Okay. This is an example. I, I, it's always dangerous to short something like a biotech, but this is an example of a of a big, thick stock. I wonder if the HP was back here. Can anybody plot that? I can't plot it with anything I have here. Cool. I'm welcome. Fantastic. Yeah, I have it. Uh, I was at World of Traders a few years ago. I don't know what's going on with uh, with those guys, but I haven't heard back from them. I know that are they still doing the English version of the magazine? Because I did a lot of articles for uh, Traders, which is owned by the corporation, and that's probably why I got invited. Um, yeah, we talked about that one, Jason. CELC. Um, I would put this on your watch list. Looks like it could be a little thin, but it is an IPO. Uh, definitely, it has pretty good range, as you can see. So on a pullback, absolutely. But watch the, make sure you have some uh, big, you know, volume's a little tricky in IPOs. You have to actually look at each individual day to see how much volume is in there. It, it takes a little, it's, it takes me a while to explain that. But just look at each day. It's probably the quick explanation. Um, Z Lab is okay. I would not buy it just yet. It's okay as far as putting on a watch list. Uh, maybe you could do a, uh, it's already triggered some breakout things. I would wait for, I wouldn't trade the next breakout, but what I would do is let it break out and then trade a pullback along the way. Okay. HCC, HCC. 
Uh, no, my problem with this one is it uh, it broke out and just got to its prior high in here. So it would have to break out to brand new highs again and then trades and pullbacks along the way. That's my only problem with that one. Oop, I just deleted somebody's uh, ticker by accident. So if you ask about one, just let me know. Case study XNet. All right, let's take a look at that. XNET. Um, I like where you're going with that, Andre. Um, when you see a stock take off, this is part of the deliberate practice. And the first thing that kind of jumps out at me is this, uh, this bar back here. You need to ask yourself, could you have caught the pattern or should you have caught the pattern? And is there a possible new pattern there? Now, even in perfect hindsight, I would not have taken this trade back here because you do have a lot of overhead supply. You do have a couple of bars that pushed into it, but you have a lot of overhead supply. You probably have a bow tie that formed. Eh, it's kind of, yeah, it's sort of a bow tie here. But I would, I would say even with perfect hindsight, it probably would not be a trade that I would have taken back then. So if we fast forward a little bit, let's see what happened. I'm not seeing a whole lot to get me too excited about to actually taking this trade in here because you do have a lot of overhead supply along the way. Now, remember, no methodology is perfect. So even with that breakout, there's really no, there's really nothing that I could see. And that's, and obviously I know the chart. I could see the left side of the chart. There's not a whole lot that would have gotten me excited about jumping in on that. So, yeah, I mean, it doesn't work in all markets. doesn't work all the time. Several new IPOs today could be interesting. Yeah, I'll make sure I get my list updated. Um, there's a, I got a little formula I use to, to get the new IPOs. Real simple. NOG for Howard. We're going to have to wrap it up in about two minutes. Yeah, uh, it's down here, kind of a penny stock. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, I think it's worth watching. Uh, it will have some bad memories to deal with along the way. Uh, keep in mind that sometimes these, um, I don't know all the rules, but sometimes with these cheap stocks, especially on the New York Stock Exchange, they can reverse split you to death. And if one of my clients didn't know what that was until he got reverse split to death on something. <laughs> Google it. Yeah, so I would let it keep breaking out and then maybe on a pullback. But make sure it's super duper strong before you do beta. And yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, it did pull back to its prior breakout. At first glance, I really like it, but it did pull back to its prior breakout. I'll give you an okay on that one. It's not bad. I would put this on my watch list and then... Uh, Maybe see if there's anything else that you could find that you like better. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and scratch it off now, now that I kind of looked at it a little bit. Just because it broke out, it came all the way back in. You go all the way back to middle of September, and it's made no far progress. I mean, you could certainly do much worse. It is a longer-term trend. It has pulled back, but it has lost a little steam in here. So I'd see if I could find something else. And the video, last one. Did we talk about that one? Yeah, uh, I want to pull back, put that on your watch list. You know, I'm wondering, that's a good question, um, or, you, or you got me thinking. We may have backed into something. I just read where these, uh, and I don't want to confuse this with facts, but th like I said earlier, they're using graphic cards to make these computations. So will NVIDIA benefit from this blockchain thing, okay? And maybe we just need to pay attention. We don't have to rush out and do a whole lot of research. All we have to do is let the technicals tell us what to do by running our scans every day and looking at these charts. And then the NVIDIAs of the world will come up if, if they are benefiting from this blockchain type of thing. Um, as you can tell, I love doing these shows. Thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate it so much. Any unanswered questions, David, Dave, Lander.com. Everyone have a fantastic weekend if we don't talk to you now and then. And hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.